right, we've been talking about the importance of a prepared heart. Um, so let's read at the top of our outlines as we begin tonight. We'll pick up uh, where we left off last Thursday night. Um, we're moving in the parable of the sower, one of the key, key parables of the Bible. Jesus said to his disciples, after he explained, uh, actually he laid out the first portion of this parable, which kind of uh, lacked um, plain term explanation to it, and so they all kind of were scratching their heads, and he said, okay, I get it. You don't understand what's going on here. He said, but you'll get there. But in the meantime, this is what he says to him. Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all of the rest of the parables if you don't get this one? So now Jesus goes into the explanatory segment of this parable. And if you want to know kind of the cryptic side of it, you read the first 12 verses of this chapter. He said, here's the explanation or the application. He said, the sower sows the word. And he said, the first group of people are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear the word, Satan comes immediately, and he takes away the word that was sown into their hearts. Then he moves to the second group that he had previously described. He said, the second group are the ones sown where the seed is sown on stony ground, who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness, but because they have no root in themselves, they only endure for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble, they stumble away. You don't see them anymore. The third group of people, he said, are the ones where the seed is sown among thorns. Now, right? now we're not seeing rocks anymore. We're seeing thorns. And I'm going to explain what all this stuff means. <clears throat> sown among thorns. And these are the ones who hear the word, but what happens? Over the course of time, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things. Boy, that's a very generalized term, isn't it? The desires for other things. Creeps into their life, and what does it do? It chokes the word, and that word in their hearts and in their lives becomes unfruitful. That means ineffective. It doesn't accomplish what it was set out to accomplish. And then the fourth group are the people where the seed is sown on the good ground, and they hear the word, they accept it, they receive it, and that's crucial, and then they bear fruit. But even amid that group, some people in the fruit-bearing group will bear 30-fold, that means a 30-fold increase on return, some 60, and some 100. So here's the good news, I guess. We all get to choose where we're going to fit into this puzzle. We all get to choose where we're going to wind up in the sense that we get to choose if we're going to receive the word. We get to choose what we're going to do with the word, if anything. Uh, you know what? We also have the ability to make a choice to do nothing with it. We have the ability to make choices that would be counterproductive to that seed bearing fruit in our lives. Life is full of choices, isn't it? And we get, we get the right to make choices. Now, there may not be condemnation, but there certainly will be consequences attached to every choice. So we have to be careful of the choices that we make. Um, and so this is what this parable is about. The four potential uh, soil qualities of a person's heart. And this is very, very important that we maintain watch over our hearts because this is where the battle is going to begin and end. This is where our destiny will begin and end, the quality and condition of our heart. So the Word of God is sown into our heart, and it's got to come to fruition, first of all, within our heart. The condition of our heart will determine what goes on with the Word in reference to our lives. The condition of our heart. Listen, you can, you can buy the most expensive seed on the planet, guaranteed to grow the best crops. But if you sow it in soil that's unprepared, it's not the seed's fault. It's always the soil's fault. 
You see what I'm saying? So this, this, this parable itself is really a, a microcosm of everyday life. Think about the setting. The setting of this parable was in agricultural times. They didn't have factories back in Jesus' day. But many people had farms, many people had vineyards, many people had cattle. So it was a very agricultural setting. And against that backdrop, Jesus gives an agricultural parable so that people would readily understand it. They would relate to every aspect of this. So it was a lesson for them from everyday life. And here was the reality. Because the seed, the farmer sowed the seed, the farmer knew if I, hear, if I was hearing this for the first time, I would know immediately when Jesus gave the four possible groups, I would know immediately that when a farmer sows the seed, there's no guarantee that every one of those seeds is going to bear a hundredfold harvest. That farmers would sow with different results. All the seeds, even the hand-sown seeds, do not always hit the target. Let me talk about it from a Christian standpoint. You could go to the greatest church in the world and still be a carnal Christian. You know, all these churches that you see on TV, mega, mega churches, and oh, man, and people think, oh, man, if I could only go to that church. I watch that guy on TV every week. I love that church. If I could only go to that church. I'll tell you what, that church would only be as good as you. If you think that's the perfect church, it became imperfect the day you walk in. There's no such thing. There's no such thing. But everybody feels like, everybody feels like the grass will be greener on that side of the fence. If I could only sit under that person. That preacher has nothing to do with your growth other than he's going to set the table. But I promise you this, what you don't see on that, you know, edited, cleaned up, glossed over broadcast are all the carnal people in that church. All the rebellious people in that church, all the knuckleheads in that church, all the flakes in that church. They're not going to show them on the broadcast, you understand. They're going to edit that baby down to where those people don't even exist. Because that's certainly not what they want to put on a 30-minute broadcast. So the, the fact of the matter is, I'm not down, you know, disrespecting those churches or those preachers. I'm saying... Most cases, the condition of your heart is what makes the difference. Obviously, the quality of what's preached definitely has a part to play in that. Because if you're getting a level one every week out of a potential level 10, well, you know, you'll be getting saved every week whether you need it or not. The fact is, we got to get to deeper stuff than that if we're going to become oak trees. Otherwise, we just stay little plants. So, obviously, it has a, a, a part to play in it. But the farmer, even the best of farmers, when he would sow the seed by hand, which was the order of the day, not every seed would hit the target. And he knew that. Not every seed that was left alone would wind up finding some nice, warm, soft soil in which to germinate. Much of the seed that was sown, even back then when it was sown by hand, would never get a chance to grow because of the birds of the air would come. You ever watch birds? You don't believe me, just plant some new grass on your front lawn. You'll attract a crowd. Those birds are going to come and want to take all that seed right out of your lung. Um, so Jesus ended this parable by saying this, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Whenever Jesus said that, it was in the strongest possible way saying, this is one of the most important things I've ever said. So if you've ever heard anything, I pray that you've heard this. And he definitely attached that, that statement to the end of this parable. So it had everything to do with the heart. Now, this was a parable that contained mysteries, a mystery that the disciples had a privilege to get a glimpse into. 
Uh, but before Jesus revealed it, they were blinded as to its full truth. So Jesus now begins to explain. And of course, the seed that Jesus was referring to was what? The Word. The Word. Why was he saying that? Because he himself was preaching the Word. Just before him, John the Baptist was preaching the Word. And so he was also referring to the fact that John the Baptist was preaching. Some people received it. Some people called him a nut job. Jesus came preaching, some people received it, many people called him a nut job. You see, so it was being played out even as they spoke. How about the Pharisees? You know those stony hearts in one of those groupings? Guess who the Pharisees were? That stony heart that was going to receive nothing. Because they were so prideful and arrogant and they thought they knew it all. So Jesus is having this thing play out in real time. Now, the interesting thing is that all four groups of people received the same word. But because the seed falls on various types of soil, it brings forth all kinds of different results. Think about what goes on in your life sometimes. Depending on where, how deep you are in the Lord or a person is in the Lord, somebody could go through a crisis. The person on the side of them on the left could go through the same crisis. The person on the right could go through the same crisis. And only, the, only one of them makes it through the crisis. Why? It depends on how deep they are in the Lord. In many cases, how closely they're holding on to Him. What they've already been through. It, how they have, been, have they been toughened up? Has the seed of previous days found good root and good soil to carry him through this, this, this storm? So every day we walk with the Lord, guys, it's important because we're building. I want you to picture your walk with the Lord uh, like uh, a brick mason building a brick building. You watch those masons work, right? They got the trowel, shh, brick, clean it up. Next, just brick, bang, tap it down, clean it up, next brick. And they just, they just take what? One brick at a time. And every layer goes up is called a course. So they do one course at a time. They go around the building, come back to where they started. Here we go again. Right? Seems tedious. But they have to pay attention to every detail. Because they can't, you know, if they don't pay attention, guess what? The wall starts to go like this. Or maybe the wall, instead of being plumb, starts to do this. Or the corner gets out of whack. If the corner gets out of whack, then everything else gets out of whack. That's why Jesus is the chief cornerstone of our faith. He's the one from which we find out whether we're level and plumb. He's the one from which we take all of the measurements of our life. He's the one against whom we measure our life. We don't measure our life against the person on the left and the right of us because we might be a little bit further along than this person and a little bit behind this person. We're not in competition with each other. The only thing we're in competition with is our own potential. We have to, we've got to be striving to get closer to him so that we can be the best you and I that we have been designed and created to be. And all of that is not going to just be about functions and gifts. All of that has got to be governed by being more like Jesus every step of the way, not just being better at our gift. You understand what I'm saying? So it's impossible to, over the long term, to get excellent in your gift without drawing closer to Him. Because it's about drawing closer to Him not just becoming excellent in your gift. That's where this whole aspect of destiny gets so overused. And it can get taken out of context so that people are wind up chasing a destiny. Oh, I'm called to some great calling, and I'm going to call it. And they get all amped up over some great destiny. And they forget about drawing closer to Jesus. So that's what we want to do. All of this is based upon drawing closer to him. 
and then all these things start to fall into place. And one of the beautiful parts about drawing closer to him is that he causes a peace to come into our life through which he whispers to us, I've got this. It's under control. I know where I'm taking you. I know the journey that you're on. I know where you're at, and I know how to get you where I need you to be. But it's one day at a time, one brick at a time. Sound good? All right, so let's go to Roman numeral two now. <clears throat> We're cultivating the soil of our hearts. Yeah, we got this guy over here. He's just relaxing, taking it all in in the front row. All right. Cultivating the soil of our hearts. So let's look at the four potential soils that we can have. Number one is this. We can have a hard heart. We can have a hard heart. You ever met a hard-hearted person? Now look at what the piece of this parable is right under point one. Jesus said the sower sows the word. He said but the hard-hearted person are the people, are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. And when they hear the word, Satan comes. Of course, one of the metaphors for what Satan does in terms of stealing the seed is how birds come and steal the seed, right? And so there's a thievery that takes place when the seed doesn't find the right soil and when it's not protected well. So um, when this farmer would go, he would have a bag kind of slung over his shoulder, and this bag would be like a, a burlap bag, and this is what he'd be doing. He'd be walking up and down where, where it had been plowed, and by hand, he'd be throwing the seed like this. And so inevitably, some of the seed would fall in various places, and some of the seed would fall on, when he says the wayside, that means the, uh, the path the paths that people would walk on. You know when you walk on a path over and over again, even if it's nice, soft soil, it becomes hard when people continue to walk on it. And so when the seed would wind up falling, inevitably, because the wind would blow and some of the seed would just bounce and fall over this, this way and that way, it would be much easier for the birds of the air to come and steal that. And so when we talk about that, we also get a picture of a person who hears the word, but they really don't believe it because their heart is not ready to receive. So the word comes, and it's almost like the seed that fell on, the, on that, that dirt pathway that had been tromped down. It's hard. It's got a crusty top, right? And the seed falls. It wants to go in, but it can't go in. And so when people have a hard heart, for example, you invite someone to church and they say, whatever. All right, I'll come to get you off my back. Now, every once in a while, the Holy Spirit still gets a hold of somebody. And they never forget what they've heard. And it may take years, though, for that seed to grow up in their heart. And they may have to go through some hard times before they finally yield. But it doesn't have to always be the hard way. He'd rather it be the easy way. But how many of you know that there's something about hitting a brick wall that gets our attention? But it doesn't have to be brick walls all the time. Now granted, sometimes it's baseball bats and two by fours, but it doesn't have to be a brick wall all the time. Um... But when our hearts are ready, it's so much easier in the process. And so these people are like the people that come, they receive, I mean, they hear the word, they hear it, but they don't really believe it. So the word doesn't have a way to get in. It winds up sitting on the pathway and it makes easy, makes it easy for the birds to come and take it. So spiritually speaking, it makes it easy for the devil to come. And as soon as they walk out the door, the devil's already whispering, Sometimes he tells them, you don't need that stuff. Do you really believe that? Or third, you're fine with religion. Just go do your Christmas and Easter thing. 
get God off your back, give him visitation rights a couple times a year, it's all good. Just try and be a good person. So you see, all of those thoughts, in effect, are unbiblical thoughts, but it makes sense to a logical mind when I'm not ready to receive the fact that I don't know everything and I have to be open to truth that's beyond me. But the flesh will always pull back and want to go the path of least resistance. What's going to cost me least to get the most benefit? Just be religious. And so there's a danger in that. And so the devil comes, he takes the word. So it falls on the path. Birds come, take it. Travelers stomp on it. And it doesn't amount to anything. It gets taken before it has a chance to penetrate the ground or penetrate the heart. Now, why is it so important that we're dealing with the heart, and why is the heart the beginning and end? Look at what I've put next on your notes for you. The reason why the heart is so important in the process here is that, number one, the heart is the center of our affections. Look at what David wrote. David prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the intent of the thoughts of the heart of your people. And Lord, he's praying, Lord, fix the hearts of the people of Israel always toward you. Why is David praying that? Because the heart is the center of our affection. Right? You hear these love songs? I love you with all of my... That's why people are saying that. I love you with all of my heart. It's the center of our affections. But look at secondly. The second reason why the heart is so important is that the heart is what the Lord looks at when he is evaluating us. Aren't you glad that the Lord doesn't always look upon our failures? He looks upon our heart. That means he looks upon the intentions and the motivations of our heart. Now, that's not always good news for everybody. Those realities are not always good news to everybody. But generally speaking, they should be good news that in that he looks past the exterior and he looks into the heart. Look at 1 Samuel 16, 7. This is when little David was a teenager and he was out keeping his father's sheep and the great prophet Samuel of the land has been instructed by the Lord to go to David's father's house because the next king of Israel, he was to anoint the next king of Israel. David never thought in a million years it would be him. So Samuel is trying to get each one of the brothers, and he's saying, well, this must be the guy. He looks sharp. And the Lord said, no, it's not him. So he goes through all the brothers, and he says to himself, I've been a prophet my whole life. I know I've heard from God that this is the place that the next king of Israel is. So he asked Jesse, the father, he said, do you have any more sons? He said, well, I have one more. He's a young guy. I don't think a whole lot of him. He's out keeping the sheep. Why? Would you call him in, please? you got to be kidding me. No, just call him in. Calls him in. Samuel looks at him, and the Lord said, he's the one. The one that's overlooked. The one that people don't think much of. The one that people would never give the time of day to. I've looked upon his heart, and he's the one I've chosen. And this is what the Lord said to Samuel. Now, this is Samuel, the great prophet, and even he got fooled. Even he got fooled with how, how sharp and together these other dudes looked. And the Lord said to him, Samuel, do not look at his appearance or the height of his stature because I've refused him. That means the rest of the brothers. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And Samuel said, okay. I just got my lesson there. Now, the third reason why the heart's important is the heart is the center of our values. Jesus said, wherever your treasure is, whatever you treasure, whatever your priorities are in life, there your heart, the center of your affections are going to be attached there. The center of our values begin there. And then last, 
The heart is important because the heart is, our, is the center of our self-worth and the center of our potential. Look at the scripture, Proverbs 4.23. said, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. And then another translation of that same verse says, guard your heart above all else, your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Isn't that amazing? Um, this is what this really means. The word issues, in the first translation of that word, the word issues, one of the sub-definitions of the word issues is the word parameters. So when, a, when, an architect, when an architect draws a building, let's say a room, and he or she's going to put dimensions of that room, correct? It's going to be, you know, 10 by 12 or whatever the dimensions are of the room. And then, of course, the totality of that space will determine really the parameters in which you can decorate or paint or whatever, and uh, a contractor will make their, uh, their bids based upon the square footage sometimes of what's there, etc. And so when he's talking about parameters, here's what it means. He said, whatever enters into your heart will wind up affecting the outcome of your life substantially. So he said, guard your heart with all diligence be careful what you let in there because it's going to impact your destiny. The word parameters is attached to destiny. Here's what I mean by that. <clears throat> when, you, when you get a small child that gets beaten and battered and verbally abused, maybe they're told they'll never amount to anything and this kind of thing, do you think they're going to have an easy time in life? Now, God forbid, maybe some of you went through that. It's horrible. It's terrible. You never should have had to experience that. But unfortunately, many children are in those kind of dysfunctional settings, and it's terrible. Those children wind up, you know, they don't stay little. They grow up like everybody else biologically, but they are scarred emotionally. Their little spirit is hammered. Those words of doom those words that they'll never amount to anything, guess what? Those things put an imprint in the center of how they view themselves. The center of their creative imagery is, will be damaged and scarred because unbeknownst to them, those words went in like daggers, went in like a, a head of cattle gets branded. So guess what? That's why he's saying, be careful what you let in your heart because the issues of your life are all going to be based upon what's in there and what comes out of there. Is it any wonder that a child that grows up with those destructive words having been spoken to them and over them repeatedly, they have a really hard time succeeding in life primarily because they never come to a place where they can view themselves as being worthy of success. Or, on the other side of that coin, they are driven to be a success in everything they do because it's like, I'm going to prove the world wrong. So they are driven instead of led. See, the devil drives us, but the Holy Spirit leads us. And they are driven to prove to themselves, their parents, even though their parents might have been dead or whoever said that stuff, even though they might have passed away years ago, they're out to prove to everybody and anybody that, that I'm going to break free from those words. But it's a, it's a driving. And so it's very important that we guard our heart, right? Now, let's go to number two. Now, what I think is interesting in this whole story, this whole parable, is the fact that the, uh, that the seed, that the Word of God is being displayed here as a seed, right? And anyone that deals with, you know, anyone that's ever planted anything understands that there's no such thing as instantaneous growth. 
Again, you could have the best seed in the world in terms of quality. But when, you know, when the seed goes in the ground, there's no substitute for time. You've got to allow time. There's got to be proper watering. There's got to be nutrients. There's got to be care and love. You know, there's got to be the sunshine. Everything has to come together for the growth process to be triggered and continue well. So rest in this. You can't rush your own growth. Hello? You can't rush your own growth. I don't know. If you, if you are aware of where you are in life and where you want to be, if, you're, if you live with an awareness, I would think that most people would feel that they should be farther along than they are. I feel that sometimes. But the fact is, you can't rush growth. You, you know, you, you have to treat this like a brick mason. Just keep putting that next brick up there. And just make sure that next brick is straight and plumb and level. One brick at a time. And your building will be built. I mean, sometimes I look at those guys building that and I said, man, I would never want to do that. Only in the sense that it seems like it takes a long time. And it just, but those guys know how to relax. They get into a groove, they get into a pace, and they just keep doing it. Bang, 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 bang. And that's, you know, they kind of get into a mode where they understand this is all a process. And I've got to get the next brick right, and then the next brick right, and it all, it's all good. I mean, I tend, to, I tend to be in a rush, and I want to get things done, and, you know, I want to get to the bottom line. And so this whole building, this giant brick building, whoo, the prospect of it blows me away. All right, let's go to number two now. We can have a hard heart was number one, but number two, we can have a shallow heart. And you see the scripture. Jesus said the second group are the ones on stony ground. When they hear the word, they immediately receive it with gladness. That's not the point. But here's the point. Because they have no root in themselves, they only endure for a short time, and then they don't see them anymore. But when, whenever tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, maybe their friends start to make some wisecracks to them. Oh, you're going to church? <laughs> He's a church guy! Oh. I remember when I first started serving the Lord, all the guys I grew up with and hung out with and party with, I would come up sometimes and they'd say, Oh, Jesus is here! And at first I used to get angry. You know, jack a couple guys up and... and uh... But I said, you know what? I'm just going to play with this. You know, like, Jesus is not here. Because if he were, we'd all be on the ground. You understand that. Or I would say, thanks for the compliment. i say, Jesus is not here, but the presence of the Lord is. You know, just play with it. I wasn't going to let it offend me because they might have been, you know, they were just kind of poking to see if they could get a rise out of me. But uh, whatever. Now, we can have a shallow heart. Why? Because sometimes in Jesus' day, down under the initial layer of soil, there was limestone. And whenever something wasn't plowed properly so that the limestone got broken up, you would only go down to the first level of topsoil, and then it would hit limestone. And so the roots would try and go down, <laughs> guess what? They'd be hitting concrete. So the second group, the group of people who listen, and they rejoice, and they get all amped up and excited, uh, but they don't stick with the truth of the message, because they don't allow for their roots to go down. They don't give it enough time. They don't give it enough attention. And, you know, it only goes so deep into their hearts and it hits a shallow level. So there's an initial response, but eventually a temptation or maybe, you know, poking from their friends like happened to me gets under their skin and it causes a person 
you know, to abandon the Lord and abandon their new faith in Christ and abandon their initial response to the gospel. It happens. You know, it takes some guts to follow the Lord. Following the Lord is not for wimps. Doing nothing is for wimps. You know, some people hear with joy, they get excited about the new opportunity, but soon some other joy kind of creeps in before God's Word gets a chance to take root and grow. Tough time comes, the roots can't get down quickly enough, and almost like when a hurricane comes through a, a country, everything gets torn up out of there. So it's important that we get a root system. So it's important that when we hear the Word, we have to nurture that, protect it, water it. We've got to hang out with the right people. We've got to keep ourselves in the right setting. It's like we're in winter, right? right? Aren't we in winter right now? So you don't want to take a tree right now and plant it out on the lawn. This is not the time. So if you want anything to grow right now in New England, you have to put it in an artificial environment created by a greenhouse. So if we don't, it would be like trying to plant a little sapling now in the winter. Your intentions might be right, but the atmosphere is wrong. The ingredients are all wrong. The timing is all wrong. And it's like someone who receives the word emotionally or intellectually, but it doesn't go down deep enough, and they wind up rejecting it and walking away when the going gets tough. You know, I read this story. It said one day a preacher decided to quit. So he went into the woods to have a talk with God, one last talk. And he said, Lord, can you give me one reason, one good reason that I shouldn't quit? Look around, God said. Do you see the fern and the bamboo? He said, yes. And the Lord said, when I planted the fern and the bamboo seeds, I took very good care of both of them. I gave them light, I gave them water, but the fern grew quickly from the earth. Its brilliant green covered the, uh, you know, the forest floor, yet nothing came from the bamboo seed. But I did not quit on the bamboo. In the second year, the fern grew more vibrant and more plentiful, and again, nothing came from the bamboo seed. But I did not quit on the bamboo. He said, in the third year, there was still nothing from the bamboo seed, but I still wouldn't quit on it. In the fourth year, again, there was nothing from the bamboo seed, but I still wouldn't quit, said the Lord. Then in the fifth year, a tiny sprout came up from the earth. Compared to the fern that was growing for five years and was visible to everyone, it seemed small and insignificant, but in just six months after it broke through the earth, that bamboo rose to over 100 feet high in just six months. It had spent five years under the surface, overlooked, growing a root system. The roots went down so deep, so well, so strong, so pervasive, that it made it everything, gave it everything that it needed to survive to go to the heights that it was destined to go to. Otherwise, it would have fallen over if the root system could not sustain that height. He said, you see, I would not give any of my creations a challenge that it could not handle. He said to me, do you know, my child, that all this time that you've been struggling, you've actually been growing deeper roots. I would not quit on the bamboo, and I will never quit on you. Don't compare yourself to others, the Lord said, others. The bamboo had a different purpose than the fern. The fern was to look beautiful, but it was only to go on the forest floor. Yet they both make the forest beautiful. Then God said to me, your time will come. Humble yourself under my hand, and I will raise you up, and you'll become like the bamboo. Don't be preoccupied with how high I raise you up, but occupy yourself with fully living out the purpose that I'm raising you up for. Isn't that great? Let's go to number three. 
The third group, third reality is that we can have a distracted heart. We can have a distracted heart. Jesus said, these are the ones who hear the word, but the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things enters in, chokes the word, the word becomes unfruitful. These are the people that listen to the word, but never come to full maturity. The thorny soil represents those who are choked out of a healthy walk with God because they allow distractions to come in. They might be interested in the message, but they don't fully commit to it, to it because of their devotion to material things, things of this world. You know, riches and possessions and whatever. Not bad things, but things can become a distraction. When you're trying to pursue five things at once, how well are you going to do with any of them? Right? You have to get, you've got to get focused like a laser beam. We have to have a focus in life. And we have to have priorities. You know, so these are the people that hear the word, but they don't meditate it on it and get it down into their hearts. They get caught up into the worries of daily life, the concerns, all of the things that worldly people are scrambling for, um, they get caught up into. It's not an issue of the things, it's an issue of priorities, being out of whack. So their wrong priorities in life take away the benefit that the seed has to offer them. So, and the seed doesn't get the nutrients that the soil possesses. And so the word comes into their heart, but because of these distractions, the seed can't go down fully, can't pull up the nutrients, and so the word gets choked out before it comes to fruit-bearing maturity. Um, listen, you know, it's, there's a saying that says, unless we know the difference between flowers and weeds, we are not fit to take care of a garden. So it's not enough to have truth planted in our minds. We've got to learn and live in such a way and labor to keep the ground, the soil of our heart clear of thorns and briars, worries, other things which have an evil propensity to choke the word out of our life. I want you to see Look at right under point three. Look at what Jesus said. The cares of this world. Now, how many of you know that we've got to be, we've got to have some cares in this world. We have to care about things. We have to be responsible, don't we? we if you have a good job, you have to care what you look like when you show up. First of all, you have to care that you show up. I know that's a lost art, but believe me, somewhere along the way, it still works. You have to show up when you're supposed to show up. You can't look like something that the cat didn't even want to drag in. You've got to be able to do your job with a clear head. You've got to do it right. You have to do it well. You can't be a slacker, right? You have to produce according to whatever your job is. <clears throat> or they're going to put you out the door and get someone in who can get the job done. So those are all cares and concerns, but those are all vital ones. But when it transitions into worries and anxieties and, you know, all the things that will consume our hearts and our minds and our lives without giving God any chance to come in and be the leader that He needs to be, then we're taking stuff on us that we're not graced to carry. And that weight that we're not graced to carry begins to crush us under. It's like trying to run the Boston Marathon with a sack of bricks on your back. You can only do that for a short time before you collapse under the weight of things that you weren't meant to carry for that. And so in our hearts and lives, notice the cares of this world. So there's some things that are legit. The deceitfulness of riches. Notice what he doesn't say. The evil of riches. He doesn't say the evil of riches. He said they're just deceitful. What you think you're going to bring you, they don't deliver. What you think it's going to do for you, it doesn't do for you. Listen to this. 
what you have to do sometimes in order to get it, it's not worth selling your integrity. You know, we've actually had Christians over the years saying, I was praying for a job and God, you know, the Lord opened the door for a job. I said, great. Where's the job? Well, I got to work 85 hours a week in Stanford. Um, but you have a wife and three kids. And they're all little. How are you going to do that? Well, I don't know, but I prayed and, you know, and this, you know, and I got the call for Hold it. Not everything that looks good is God ordained. How? How are you going to pull this off at 80 hours a week in Stanford and you live here with a car that's about to drop dead? And even if it doesn't drop dead, you will. When you come home, what are you going to have left to give of yourself to your wife and children? Nothing. You'll be so fried, you'll be a zombie. You'll come in, eat, good night. On the weekends, you'll be useless. You're trying to catch up on all the sleep you never got. How well is that going to go for your family? That'll be good for a little while, only in the terms of the paycheck, but it's going to cause your relationship, your family life to go down the drain. So, you know, not everything, not every door that opens is necessarily the right door. Because sometimes... <clears throat> There's deceitfulness. Anytime there's deceitfulness of riches involved, that means that there's always a string attached. You know, the Bible says that the blessing of the Lord is what makes our lives rich. And whenever he brings a blessing, there's no sorrow that comes with it. That means there won't be a string attached that's going to cost you some, more than it's worth. Does that make sense to you? Um, you know, Jesus doesn't call us to be hermits to seek refuge from the real world. But he seeks us, he seeks believers that will walk with him, get right priorities, and have a right perspective on, um, on where life fits in over against the, the plan of God and the purpose of God and the family and all the responsibilities that we have in life. So, the cares of this world. Second thing are deceitfulness of riches. Remember, not the evil of riches. Money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is. So, don't misquote the Bible. Money is not the root of all evil. Money is a piece of paper. Think about money. Anybody have at least a dollar in your pocket? I don't even have one, but not with me anyway. But, uh, if you have a dollar in your hand, See, that dollar, bear with me now, let's make it a 50. If you had a $50 bill, that could be either be used to buy crack with or be brought to the house of the Lord to facilitate the purposes of the kingdom of God. Same, you understand, that same 50 may have been used to buy crack last week somewhere. Then that crack dealer, that crackhead went into a store, purchased some goods, the shopkeeper took the money in. Then the shopkeeper put it in as a deposit into the bank. Then you went to an ATM, maybe drew out 50. And that same $50 bill that ran this whole circuit got into your hands. Now you bring it to the house of the Lord. And it's prayed over and consecrated. Money's a piece of paper. It's the love of money that destroys people's lives, causes them to do things that are unscrupulous and not good. And the desire for other things. What are those things? I don't know. Could be a million things. But here's the point about all of these things that choke the word potentially. None of those things in and of themselves are evil. None of those things that Jesus mentions are in and of themselves evil. But they're nonetheless used by the devil when things get out of whack in terms of priority. Riches aren't evil. Being careful and concerned in the right order is not evil. Because that means you're a responsible person. The desire for other things. How many of you have some hopes and dreams? Maybe if you're not a homeowner, maybe one of these days, man, I want to buy, I'd love to buy a house. Maybe I'd like to get a new car that won't die on me. 
I, I'd like to get this and I'd like to get that. I like, good for you. Nothing wrong with those things. Those are desire for other things. Just keep right priorities and God will bless you. Thank you so much for joining us today. If God has impacted your life through this message, please join Victory in reaching people all around the world by sowing back into the kingdom today. You can give at rvictory.org slash give or download the Victory Church app and select give. Find Victory on social media for bonus teachings and content all throughout the week. 